Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for LiveWire, a stimulating night of neurotechnology. My name is Garrett Flynn, and I'm the coordinator of the Brains at Play Initiative, one of many organizations, including USC Visions and Voices, Amundsen Lab of the USC Sydney Harmon Academy for Polymathic Study, OpenBCI, Alteria, and Athenoi, who have supported the production of this event for you tonight. It is amazing that we have people tuning in from across the world today. As LiveWire is part of the USC Visions and Voices series, we believe it's important to open our event by acknowledging the indigenous land that our university shares. Therefore, our production team acknowledges that the University of Southern California, both the University Park campus and the Health Sciences campus, were built on the ancestral and sacred land of the Tongva Valley, Tongva Nation. We honor the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future, and we pay respect to their continued survival and contribution to our society. We also honor the legacy of the African diaspora and recognize that this country would not exist without the free enslaved labor of black people. We share these acknowledgements to raise awareness about histories that are too often erased or forgotten, to pay respect to the original caretakers of this land and to recognize our place in this history. We hope that this work continues beyond our event and helps inform our individual and collective actions in the years ahead and for generations to come. This evening, we planned much for you to participate in. In addition to Discord, we invite you to post your questions and reactions in real time on Discord, an online chat site for creating communities. We've just posted a link to our Discord server in the Zoom chat, so feel free to join as soon as you can. Tonight's speakers and nine invited experts in neuroethics will be available on Discord throughout the event to engage with you and answer any questions that you might have. We'll begin our journey into neuro neurotechnology tonight with a series of lightning talks featuring Dong Song from the USC Center for Neural Engineering, Aaron Klein from the U University of Washington Center for Neurotechnology, and Judy Ellis from Neuroethics Canada at the University of British Columbia. Following these talks, we'll have a dedicated public brainstorm on Discord until 5.10 Pacific time. For those of you who can't join the Discord, I'll be rotating through our attending experts and inviting them to publicly comment on high engagement posts here on Zoom. So for everyone here on Discord, make sure to show your enthusiasm by replying and reacting to others' posts. And for those of you remaining on Zoom, get ready for a lively discussion of neurotechnology and ethics. Finally, after the brainstorm has subsided, We'll wrap up the night with a concluding talk by Joe Artuso from OpenBCI on open neurotechnology. So let's begin. For tonight's first lightning talk, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dong Song and his talk, The Past, Present, and Future of Neural Prostheses. Dr. Song is a research associate professor of biomedical engineering and co-director of the USC Center for Neural Engineering. He invented the multi-input, multi-output, nonlinear dynamical model of spike transformations that serves as the computational basis for hippocampal memory prostheses. Thank you for being here, Dr. Song. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction to the history, the current status, and also future perspective of neural prostheses, and to share some of my thoughts on its scientific and philosophical implications. So in 1780s, Luigi Gavani, a professor at the University of Bologna, he conducted one of the most famous experiments in the history of science. He dissected a frog, exposed his sciatic nerve for his anatomic studies. Quite accidentally, he touched the nerve with a metal scalpel charged with electricity. Then something unexpected happened the dead frog twitched his leg. An external electricity changed an animal's behavior. So this single moment marks the beginning of electrophysiology and the neural stimulation, which eventually leads to neural processes. So since this very early beginning, new technology has come a long way and made many impressive progresses in the past two centuries, uh, especially the past decade. Researchers start to use new stimulation to treat different neurological disorders, including Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. So in this Medtronic system shown in the bottom right corner, electrical stimulation was delivered from this implanted device 
to the targeted brain region to suppress tremor or stop seizure. This device and the so-called deep brain stimulation have been very successful in treating uh, Alzheimer disease, uh, yeah, Parkinson disease and seizure. However, it's less successful in other neurological diseases such as dementia and Alzheimer disease. One of the fundamental reasons is that in these diseases, relevant brain regions as shown uh, on top, right? showed profound cell loss and the neurodegeneration. The brain region is too severely damaged and make it nearly impossible for their function to be restored. So to solve this problem, one of the more promising approaches is to use neural processes to replace the damaged parts. And different from DBS, new processes seek to mimic the neural functions and reinstate the new signal of transmission. For example, in cochlear processes, a little microphone was used to record the sound and transform it into new stimulation to the cochlear nerves. By doing that, it bypassed the damaged peripheral auditory system and restored auditory function. So deaf people can hear. In retina processes, a camcord is used to transform visual input to stimulations to the retinal ganglia cells. So it bypasses damaged retinal layers and restore visual function. So blind people can see. And in the more recent motor processes, the device recorded from motor area, like the M1 region of the, of the brain, decodes the signal into intended movement by doing that, it bypasses the damaged spinal cord and restore motor functions. So paralyzed people can move. Based on those principles, researchers at USC, including myself, develop hippocampal memory processes for restoring memory functions lost in injuries or diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. So the idea is try to use a biomimetic device as shown in this uh, uh, cartoon, to bypass the damaged brain region, to reinstate the signal transmission, and eventually restore cognitive function, the lost cognitive function. So in intact patients, patients with, without Alzheimer's disease, information was encoded in spatial temporal pattern spikes in the downstream region of the hippocampus. And the hippocampus can transform the signal into a property form for the formation of long-term memory. When the hippocampus is damaged, the short-term memory is still intact, but the patient loses its ability to form new long-term memory. And our goal is to try to build this device to record from the upstream region of the hippocampus and use a mathematical model to predict what the desired output signal should be. And then use microelectric stimulation to write in that signal back to the hippocampus. And by doing that, to reinstate the signal transmission and eventually restore the lost memory function. So in the heart of this process is a mathematical model describing the input output signal transmission. This model is built based on biological principles and machine learning techniques. It can capture complex nonlinear dynamical transformation from input signals of the hippocampus to output signals. So the model was able to very accurately predict the output signal as shown uh, you know, uh, on top of the figure based on the ongoing input signal in the C3 region as shown in the middle panel. You can see the similarity between the actual pattern and the predicted pattern by the model. So using the model predicted output signal, we can drive microelectrical stimulator. We were able to write in the memory information back to the hippocampus. And all results show that this memory coded based stimulation overlays on the normal hippocampal signal transmission can enhance both short-term and long-term memory functions in epilepsy patients. So these advances in new technology have drawn a lot of public attention. 
people start to wonder whether we can do things described in sci-fi movies. For example, download and upload people's memories, learn skills in virtual reality, as in the movie Matrix. Or even keep a full record of the memories, uh, people's memory, so you can rewind your memories to arbitrary time point, as in the TV series Black Mirror. Startup companies like Neuralink and the Kernel are funded to develop next generation neural interface technologies that aim to enhance human intelligence so it can be better incorporated with artificial intelligence. And in academia, the number of researchers and the publications on neural processes has been exponentially growing as shown in this PubMed research results. And note that decline in 2020 is probably due to the pandemic. The growth is expected to recover as, after the pandemic is over. So this is an exciting time, but here I want to emphasize that these technologies are still in very early stage. There are many remaining critical challenges that need to be overcome before new processes like uh, those described in the movie can become clinical viable or even a consumer product. So first, we still have very limited knowledge to basic neuroscience problems, such as how the brain works. Second, we still don't have the perfect neural interface technology that allow us to record a lot of neurons from a lot of brain regions chronically and less invasively. So we are still missing the computational model and the framework for describing the brain. And also we haven't tested the processes for naturalistic behaviors during a long period of time. And lastly, which I really want to emphasize today in the context of this uh, 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 event, is that the ethical implications of new processes are still poorly understood. In fact, new processes was an important issue since the very beginning. So let's go back to history. As soon as Gawani discovered what he called animal e electricity, in his famous frog experiment. His long-term competitor, Alessandra Walter, invented batteries that can generate electrical charges as shown on the left, on the right. Not too long time after, he tested electrical stimulation on himself. He inserted two metal rods to his ears to electrically stimulate with his, his own battery. And here is what he experienced. I received a shock in the head, and some moments after I began to hear a sound, or rather noise in the ears, which I cannot well define. It was a kind of a cracking with shocks, as if some taste or tenacious matter had been boiling. The disagreeable sensation, which I believe might be dangerous because of the shock in the brain, prevented me from repeating this experiment. The water is a curious and brave researcher. But I can assure you that by today's standard, such experiment is not only dangerous, but also unethical to be performed on human subjects. There's no chance for such experiments to be approved by any IRB at any universities nowadays. So what we should do at this exponential growing era of new technology? And here's my read my view. I strongly believe that in new engineering research or in the development of a new processes, researchers shouldn't be the only player. We should include all relevant stakeholders, such as patients, their families, clinicians, healthcare providers, and the public like you, and start the conversation. I believe only with this kind of open communication, we can work together to develop not only functioning, but also ethical new technologies for the good of humanity. And this is exactly one of the main reasons we are organizing this event. And with that said, I would like to conclude my talk and take questions. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Song. One question from Laura Cabrera, one of the discussion facilitators, would be, would we be able to download and edit memories with a memory prosthesis or any neural prosthesis? So the current prosthesis is trying to restore the function of forming new long-term memory. It doesn't store the memory. So the memory is not stored in the hippocampus, but in other brain regions. So the short answer is no. Uh, it cannot be achieved by the current hippocampal memory prosthesis. But maybe later with some more advanced technology, it can be possible. Great. And Ashley M, M has a question. How can neurotechnology be made more equitable and available across socioeconomic levels? Do you have any ideas about this? Yeah, that's a great question, right? And that's exactly the reason we try to start a conversation between researchers, engineers, uh, clinicians and the uh, neuroethicists and the neuro neurologists, right? So I think we should work together because everything is in very early stage. We need to work together to find the answer for those questions. Great. And we'll take one more. So Sidhant Chinoy asks, how do you conduct your research if there are ethical issues about working on real human brains? So we need to, first, we need to identify all the uh, ethical issues. Right? We work with other people. We work all, with all the stakeholders to make sure the proposed study is ethical. Right? For example, the current uh, human study we perform at USC and our collaborator at Wake Forest University was approved by IRB. Right? We make sure we are not causing any uh, uh, no damage to the, to the additional damage to the patient's brain. And those patients are all epilepsy patients they had to take that surgery for diagnosis purpose. And we just use this patient to perform the all experiments. So everything needs to be ethical. And uh, that's relatively easier for early human study. But in the future, I think that requires more conversation, more discussion between different stakeholders. Definitely. All right, thank you for your talk. Uh, and if you have any other questions for Dr. Song, you can direct them to the Discord. I'll also repost your questions from the Zoom chat in there so we could get a second shot at them during the Discord brainstorm. So next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Aaron Klein and his talk, Stakeholder Perspectives on Emerging Neurotechnologies. Dr. Klein is a neurologist specializing in dementia at Oregon Health and Science University and the Portland VA Medical Center. He's also part of the Neuroethics Thrust at the NSF Center for Neurotechnology at the University of Washington. His work sits at the intersection of neurology, neuroscience, and philosophy. Thanks for being here, Aaron. Thank you uh, for that introduction. Let me sh uh, share my screen here. All right. Um, um, so I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I have some disclosures. I do have received um, funding from the NSF and, and NIH. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, today about the importance of gathering perspectives of people who use um, or might use neural technology, um, mostly for, for medical indications. But I think it's important to, for me to say a little bit about my positioning here, because I think it may help give a little bit of context of, of kind of where I'm coming from and, and, and why I'm uh, interested in this topic to, to start Aaron, with. You know, we can't see your screen right now. So if oh, you can't. OK. Yeah, before you go, you might want to share that. All right. All right, you're good. Is that better? Yep. Okay. All right. So, so I, I'm a neurologist uh, and a philosopher by training. Um, I'm not a, a neuroscientist or neural engineer like like Dr. Song, but I but I work alongside uh, neural engineers and neuroscientists, um, as well as computer scientists and and 
and, and, and others in a neural engineering center at the, at the University of Washington. Um, and, and some of my, my colleagues who work there with, with me are also part of the program today. Um, my role in this, in this center is to help direct attention to, to ethical issues, both kind of current and future uh, in the technology being developed. Um, you know, as part of the center, uh, you know, we sort of realized a couple of things early on. Um, first, neurotechnology raises a host of, of really interesting and important ethical questions. Um, but second, that kind of one critical part of getting a handle on these questions requires uh, talking not just to scientists, clinicians, uh, ethicists, and other sort of traditional experts, but also going out and talking to, to those who are sort of expert in, in living with conditions that neural devices are, are meant to help. So specifically people with different kinds of neurological or, or, or psychiatric disabilities. So, so as part of the center, I and, and people that I work with have, have sort of prioritized doing research um, that sort of foregrounds talking to people um, about how they do or, or might use uh, various kinds of neurotechnologies and specifically talking to them about uh, ethical issues related to these technologies. So, so, you know, I, I think it's important to, to emphasize that there, you know, there are indeed, uh, you know, various kinds of, of neurotechnologies and, you know, they, they, neurotechnologies span a wide range, right? So they, they vary by target, right? Uh, the brain or in specifically different parts of the brain, the spine, the peripheral nervous system, muscle, um, they vary by location, right? Are they, um, are they surgically implanted? Are they wearable? Um, they vary by sort of permanence, right? Some, some electrodes, um, like those uh, that Dr. Song described of, of deep brain stimulation are, are electrodes that are supposed to be implanted um, for the rest of a person's life. And then others like the ones uh, involved in the, in the um, hippocampal prosthesis uh, are, are temporary electrodes, right? That, 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 um, that are, that are uh, used for, for a short time, you know, days or weeks. Right? Um, they vary by whether uh, devices are, are, have a medical indication or whether they're going to be used non-medically. Um, and even in, if they're going to be used for medical conditions, they vary by the, the type of condition. Right, So are they going to treat someone with spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury or epilepsy? Um, and, and they vary by sort of a stage of development. Right, So you know, some technologies like deep brain stimulation are, are very well developed and, and others are, are just sort of at the incubator stage. So, so I think it's important to sort of note this heterogeneity at, at the start um, because it helps at least me keep in, in view that we need to be sort of careful about talking about the ethical implications of neurotechnology broadly because every technology is different and, uh, and every sort of population um, that technology is um, targeted toward. Uh, are different, although you know there can be significant and important overlap. So, kind of what I want to focus on less today is sort of that diversity of neurotechnology and more about kind of the emerging part of, of neurotechnology. So, so that is that you know most of the technology is, is sort of far from reaching its potential, right? It's still largely in early stages of development in universities and companies, and and even technology that's that's relatively far along, like like deep brain stimulation. Right, it's still, uh, which you know, has been implanted in hundreds of thousands of people with Parkinson's disease and essential tremor and, and other conditions. Um, this, these these devices are still probably quite crude compared to what what sort of the next generation of these devices is, is going to look like. So so even here, um, we're much closer to the start line than we are to the to the finish line. So so why is that important? Well, you know, if if um, if neurotechnologies are are early and, and yet we can start to see we can start to kind of make out the outlines of how these devices might transform human capabilities, the way they might treat diseases, assist people with disabilities, or, or just you know, allow different kinds of, of interactions with others. You know, the future is at least sort of partially in view. And if, you know, if that's the case, then the future is, is malleable, right? So there may be ways to, to influence the development of neural devices so that they um, uh, meet not just the, the kind of practical needs of, of end users, but also that, that doing so in a way that sort of pays attention to the ethical opportunities and costs and trade-offs of, of developing this, these kinds of technologies. So, you know, just by, by analogy, I mean, just think of if, if we had taken more stock of uh, privacy or the social implications of, of the internet three, three decades ago, right? The, the world might look um, uh, somewhat different than it does today. Um, so, um, so one group, you know, we uh, 
that should surely sort of shape neurotechnology are, are people who will uh, or might one day use it. So, you know, sometimes we call these, you know, people patients or, or consumers, but, but kind of a more general term is just sort of end user, right? These are, this is at the end, the end of the line of developing a technology is a particular user. Um, and this, this user can have very valuable things to say about technology, not just at the end when the, when the technology is sort of handed to them or implanted in their bodies, but, but along the road to developing that technology in the first place. Right, so there's, so there's kind of good reason to, to include end users in the development of neurotechnology. Um, you know, it's a sign not just of respect, but, but you know, some might argue a, a requirement of justice, right, to include the voices of people who will eventually use uh, technology. And even at the pragmatic level, right, getting input from end users along the way reduces the chance of a device um, uh, not getting used in the end, you know, because it's cumbersome or ugly or inconvenient or, 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 or whatever. So, so taking input from users, uh, what's called user-centered design, is a way to make sure that neurotechnology is, is effectively and, and economically developed. Uh, but, but what I want to spend a few minutes talking about um, is, is the value of talking to end users, not, not just about preferences uh, and functionality of devices, but about kind of ethical implications of these technologies and, and how they might use them. So, so that is, you know, neurotechnologies, um, and I'm going to focus mostly on, on sort of medically focused ones, can, can intersect with people's sort of deeply held moral commitments and values, you know, values such as privacy, identity, justice, um, agency, relationships. Um, so what I want to do uh, briefly is just sort of highlight a few of the things that, that we've heard from talking to users or potential end users about, about, different, um, about different kinds of technology. So, um, so, so we did this uh, study with uh, individuals who had uh, deep brain uh, stimulators implanted for Parkinson's disease. And, we, um, and one of the things that we sort of heard in this study and we've heard in other studies is that you know, having a neural device implanted can, can affect your sense of agency, right? So, you know, typically when we move or we or we think or we feel something, we assume that we're the ones doing it. But but having a, a device implanted, you know, can sometimes raise questions for people about whether it's it's them or the device that's sort of in control of their agency. So so one one gentleman we interviewed had it had, had this had a DBS and gave this nice description of sort of visiting New York City and uh, and and was there with his his wife and he and he sort of trips in the street. And uh, you know something that, that people with Parkinson's disease do, but something that we all sort of sort of do. Um, but because he had this device in, in, in place, um, he, this sort of extra thing come, comes to his mind, right? So so did I did I trip because I was careless or distracted, or whatever, or or did the device cause me to to trip, right? So am I mal am I malfunctioning or is the device malfunctioning, right? So so implanted devices can raise these questions about agency that weren't there before, or, or at least not there maybe in the same way. So similarly, you know, we, we did a, a different study, right, where we um, interviewed people who had deep brain stimulators for um, uh, treatment resistant depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. They were in trials for, uh, for these devices. Um, and, and, and we asked their, their, uh, for their experience about using these devices. And, and, um, and I like this, this quote from, from a kind of a middle-aged man who, who, who talked about how when he had the device, um, after having it for some time, he noticed that he would, he would sort of act in ways that were sort of socially or, or sort of interpersonally um, kind of crude or insensitive. And, and, and so um, he sort of wondered whether or not that was, um, whether that was just kind of him or whether or not that's, that that was somehow um, being affected by the device. And so you can imagine if, if you if you had these sorts of these sorts of worries again maybe about agency um, that you you start to you might start to wonder about sort of what what's the real me, right? Um, uh, similarly, we we've um, we talked to people who have um, uh, ALS and who um, and we talked to them about the the prospect of a of a deep brain of a Brain computer interface that might help them to, to communicate, right? That they might be able to use their um, neural activity to, to, to pick out letters or words on a screen, right? If they have difficulty uh, communicating uh, verbally. Um, and one of the things we heard lots of interesting things, but one of the things we heard was about uh, uh, concerns about privacy. Um, you know, some, some people had um, 
found found the idea that um, that researchers or clinicians might be able to record their brain activity sort of scary. And then others sort of felt like, you know, this is a perfectly fine trade-off, right? If, if it allows me to communicate and continue to communicate this, you know, despite the progression of my illness, it's, it's, it's a, uh, a trade-off that I, I gladly make. So it, it just sort of um, um, characterized for us sort of the complexity of, of of the issue of privacy, which you know is, is something that I think we're all sort of struggling with um, in, in in lots of areas of our of our lives right now. And finally, um, um, and finally, the, the, the last topic I, I wanted to, to talk about was um, kind of return to, to what uh, the, the project that Dr. Song had uh, described, which is um, uh, around the issue of, of cognitive enhancement. Um, and right, so I mean, this is a this is a, a, a topic that this kinds of re research on on memory is is going to raise, right? So it's going to raise questions about what is cognitive enhancement, um, or what what counts as cognitive enhancement, what counts as treatment, right? How should how should uh, how should it be studied? Are there limits to 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 this kinds of research? Um, and 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 as was as was raised raised in the question, um, who should have access to this, and how do we how do we ensure that it's um, uh, the access is equitable. All right, so um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna finish there. I just the 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 point of sort of these quotes isn't to isn't to say that these are the views of um, all end users or potential end users or that these views are universally shared or that they ought to dictate kind of what happens with research. Um, but it's just to point out that it, it's these kinds of data points that that haven't traditionally been part of technology development um, and yet they seem particularly relevant. Um, to have not you know not just uh, uh, to at least have on the table right for engineering teams for clinicians for funders for companies for science policymakers um, as they make choices about kind of um, technology that that, that uh, and how it and how it gets developed. So um, so I just want to thank the many people that uh, that I get to to work with, including um, uh, Professor Illis and uh, and and uh, and Song and and, uh, and Garrett. All right, thank you, Dr. Klein. So some questions rolling in from the Discord. Um, we have Ashley M again. So more of a philosophical than a scientific question, but if neurotechnology had somehow been developed centuries in the past, do you think that they would have a different outlook on whether it was ethical to use? Just... Yeah, so that's, that's um, a really interesting question. I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, I guess it's, it's similar to, to asking the question, you know, will, will we in the future uh, if this technology is successful, will we think about uh, the, these ethical questions differently? And I'm sure that in some ways, um, yeah, yes, I think, you know, if we, I think we all get, we all get shaped and society gets shaped by what technologies become uh, commonplace and, uh, and accepted. And, um, but I suspect that we're, it's, uh, that the, um, it'll raise new, new capabilities of these technologies will raise new questions. Hmm. So. Great. We have another question from Eli Kenny Lang, who says, user-centered design is a critical consideration and important when considering new neurotechnology development. How do you better incorporate underrepresented communities like pediatrics into this conversation? Um, well, so, I mean, I think, um, I think you, you make, you make, a, uh, you give up, you give priority to, to re recruiting um, the, into the, Recruiting voices of underrepresented communities. So, um, and you know, and that means so when you're when you're, you're when we go out and we talk to, to to individuals about these technologies, whether they're current technologies or, or future technologies, um, we really try to get a, a diverse sample of of individuals because uh, the the whole point of doing this is to is to get uh, all kinds of ideas um, and perspectives on the table, and if we're leaving particular groups out, uh, then we're missing out on something uh, really important. Great. And then one last question from Oscar Petrov. So how do we decide what is generally experimentally ethical with regards to various groups and nations if they're pursuing different methodologies? So how do we sort of generalize ethics across groups? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, this is a this is a um, a topic that that uh, philosophical ethics struggles with um, 
just sort of generally, right? That, that how do you, how do you, are, are there different uh, ethical standards across different, different cultures? Um, and, uh, and I don't have, a, I don't have an, an easy answer to that other than to say that, um, that I think the important thing is to put um, those, those cultures, those different um, ideologies sometimes in conversation with each other. Um, and I think the kind of more we're in conversation with each other, I think the more we find that there are com common principles, common values. Um, I, so I, I think we're, we're, we're often not, not as far apart as sometimes we assume uh, that we are. Great. All right, so thank you for your presentation. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Judy Illis and her talk in the Vortex of Signals from Brain Wearables. Dr. Illis is a past president of the International Neuroethics Society and director of Neuroethics Canada at the University of British Columbia. A pioneer and eminent scholar in the field of neuroethics, she has made groundbreaking contributions to ethical, social, and policy challenges at the intersection of biomedical ethics and neuroscience, emerging neurotechnologies for neurologic and psychiatric conditions, decision-making, cultural values, and the commercialization of healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Illis. Garrett, thanks so much for that nice introduction. Let me just get my screen shared for all of you. Dr. Song and Dr. Klein, amazing presentations. Thank you and amazing questions from the audience so far. Just to check, can you see my slides all right? All right, yes. very good. Um, I would like to um, uh, begin by acknowledging my team at Neuroethics Canada, many of whom are with us uh, in the, on Livewire today as part of uh, Voices and Visions of this wonderful USC event. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge those, all of those who support us, especially the projects that I'll be talking about today. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from uh, British Columbia and uh, I'm working and so privileged to uh, speak with you today from the lands of the Squamish Lulwit First Nations people, from Musqueam First Nations and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations people here in British Columbia. Um, I have no disclosures, um, and that's an importantly important uh, comment to make, particularly as we enter a different kind of space from the one that Dr. Song and Dr. Klein were talking about, which is the commercial space of wearable non-invasive technologies, and we focus on the brain. So I'm going to um, try to advance my screen. I'm going to ask uh, the audience two questions. If we were in a giant auditorium, I'd actually be able to see you and see your answers. Um, I hope I don't crash Zoom by asking you these questions, but we're gonna give it a whirl. We're gonna give it a try. How many of you of the 180 people on Zoom with us this afternoon own some kind of body sensor, a Fitbit, a heart monitor, uh, and you can use any kind of emoji in the reactions uh, tool to answer the question. Okay, we have some answers still coming in. Okay, I won't take too long. Keep it coming though. Um, I obviously have no idea how many of you are actually saying yes, but I'm gonna predict that it's 80% of the group who's uh, with us this afternoon. Now. I'm gonna ask on a second question is how many of you own a brain sensor? So take your hands away from the body sensor and how many of you actually own a brain sensor? And I know that this is not gonna be a representative group because probably many of you do because this is a neurotechnology interested group. All right, I see answers still coming but I'm gonna move on, but you can keep answering. I'm gonna suggest that about 10 to 20% of you, so maybe 30 to 40 people of this audience actually own some kind of brain sensor. And I'm also going to suggest to you that um, that number is going to increase by about 10% each year over the next five years. A little bit mapping uh, the uh, neuroprosthesis landscape that Dr. Song showed us in his slide earlier. So the landscape of opportunity for these devices is immense. Uh, they're immense in the direct-to-consumer space, and they're valued today to be at about 34 billion U.S. dollars. That's somewhere around 45 Canadian, 45 billion Canadian dollars, or depending on the exchange rate. And my team and I were very interested in 2009 to understand what this industry really looks like. So we turned to the publicly available open access websites of uh, 41 device companies 
um, to study what they were selling, developing, innovating, um, and promoting to consumers like you and me. Of the 41 device websites, we found that half were stimulating devices and half were recording devices, all using um, electrical currents of one form or another, either input or output devices to put in signals into the brain or take signals out. Two of the 41 companies that we found were actually both recording and stimulating device companies. Who were the users? The users were people like mostly you. I will predict people in the 20 to 35 or 40 year old uh, age range, um, mostly athletes and trainers and secondarily employers and employees. Um, but otherwise there was a wide range of users targeted by these technologies, including um, uh, researchers for using uh, devices for, uh, for research, uh, religious leaders for um, trying to understand the physiological basis of the spirit, uh, and even occasionally a device that was marketed to your pet. And you can make some decisions about the value of that uh, offline, or we can have a discussion about it. What were the claims of benefit? We found 166 unique claims of benefit across the 41 devices. Mostly they were marketed in claims of wellness products. And you'll recall that both in Canada and the United States, um, health products require regulatory approval. Wellness products fall under that radar. So most of these, almost all of them, in fact, were marketed as wellness products, some to relieve stress and anxiety, some to improve memory and sleep, and almost all making claims about um, controlling the mind through neurofeedback. Now, as scientists and engineers and ethicists, we're always interested in the evidence that underlies claims of benefit. And we studied those as well. And we found that almost all of the device websites had um, some sort of evidence on its website, again, on the publicly available sites, um, but actually only 20% of the overall claims of evidence were actually relevant. Some were, um, so, and relevance taken writ large. So many were testimonies from outside users, from consumers. Some were, test, were evidence of rhetorical content. So that would be, for example, somebody from within the company promoting the benefits of the company's claims. Um, and even we found um, some irrelevant and broken links provided as evidence to support the claims that the companies were putting forward. What were some of the risks? Well, we found some claims of safety, but not a lot. And so safety would be in, these, in this context of wearable neurotechnology, skin irritation, for example. But we found nothing about the intermixing of conventional therapeutics, for example, like psychological support or counseling with these kinds of new technological innovations. And if you loop, loop back to what I presented to you about the main claims of these devices, stress and anxiety, improving memory, improving speed of information processing, improving sleep, those really cross the fine line of uh, health and health related conditions. And yet we saw no evidence of risks that um, encouraged individuals to be cautious, to not move away from conventional therapeutics, especially those that were beneficial, um, uh, favoring the use and the purchase of these novel kinds of neurotechnological devices. What about incidental findings? Well, what are those? Those are surprises. Surprises on your recordings that aren't expected because they look abnormal or maybe abnormal, or they might be surprises in terms of a behavior that a stimulating device actually causes. In another study that we conducted in the same year as our website device study, um, we conducted interviews with CEOs and representatives, high level representatives from neurotechnology companies. And we learned from them that to date, there's no formal strategy for handling incidental findings among these neurotechnology groups. Many of them don't actually collect data that could be used to process incidental findings. And many of them claim that the kinds of recordings they were uh, receiving would not allow for an incidental finding to be detected. Nonetheless, um, they indicated to us that it wasn't a bad idea to be thinking about these things. Um, they do offer customer service 
for product complaints and adverse events. And so our study we learned generated among them both thinking on the topic about incidental findings um, and I must say some heated controversy that we learned about as well. So let's move on to yet a third study. And this is a study that we have going on at Neuroethics Canada right now. You can find the link to the study on Twitter and on my website. We actually have been asking employers and uh, employees about their use, um, whether it's required or self-directed, their use about wearable technology, again, both on the body and on the brain. And um, so these are hot off the press data. We have found that both sides agree on three major points. And they are that if, they are, if there are medically relevant incidental findings from recordings from employees, the employer has the obligation to report it out to the employee. Uh, we learned from both sides, and this surprised us a little bit, that employers and employees believe that the employee owns his and her brain data. And finally, we learned from both employees and employers that data from an employee, brain data, brain signals from an employee should not follow the employee from workplace to workplace, but reside in the workplace and with the person in which it was obtained. So I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, I am going to suggest to you that the lines are too blurry today between the recreational device space, which is these neuro wearables and body sensors that you can buy in Best Buy and other big box stores. Um, there's too much of a blurry line between these wellness products and what in fact um, ride the fine line of medical devices or health products. I think our neurotechnology sector needs to do better especially when it comes to the brain, the neurotechnology center, sector needs to be more transparent and actually put protection of people and brains above profit. Um, we'd like to see through a number of organizations, we've um, recommended that neurotechnology industry self-govern better than it's been governing before. Um, and it's a really a way of ensuring that external regulations don't come booming down in ways that are um, sometimes punitive, sometimes irrelevant, and always, always very slow to change. Um, finally, um, we, I, I'd like to suggest that a harmonization of um, ethical protections and ethical values across neurotechnology industry, across the international community would be invaluable in pushing and promoting the benefits of this kind of technology forward. Um, and at the end of the day, there's really an algorithmic growth in the capacity enabled by pattern recognition to read brain signals, uh, to place brain signals into the brain. And um, users need to be well informed about the choices that they're making and make good choices, both for today and for tomorrow. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude and invite your questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Ellis. We have one quick one from Joe Artuso. Where can we find the survey results that you're discussing? Are they published? The uh, survey results from the website study, so the content analysis uh, is um, available in a publication in Neuron. The first author will be Minnelli. Um, as um, the results of the incidental findings uh, study, the interview study was published in a chapter on actually, and that this audience might be interested in it in a, a series that I edit called Developments in Neuroethics and Bioethics. And the volume specifically is on do it yourself technology, edited by uh, Imre Bart and Elizabeth Hilt. And the study from the survey study that's ongoing now is not published yet because we want you all to respond to it and give us your views. And uh, so, of course, that publication is forthcoming in the near future. Thanks for the question. We have one more, which is how can we ensure the public has enough information about BCIs before receiving them? Is there a way that we can properly inform the public? Well, you know, that's a great question. And it's on all of us. It's on uh, the innovators, the engineers and scientists in the innovation sector to be transparent. It's on the people who develop the marketing strategies to be transparent and more forthright. 
um, and less obtuse than they've been. Um, I think it's on science journalists to communicate well about what's going on in the innovation sector. And there's a lot on us as neuroethicists to help all of these stakeholders um, do their job well so that the public can really trust what's out there and again, make really good choices. Awesome. So thank you again for your talk and thank you to all the speakers for their wonderful presentations. So now it's time to get slightly more speculative. Over the past year, the Brains at Play Initiative has been developing a software library for developing brain-controlled websites and unveiled Brainstorm, a multiplayer game that couples minds across geographic, social, and cultural boundaries. We've grown a lot since our early days at the USC Amundsen Lab and the USC Sydney Harmon Academy for Polymathic Study. And in truth, the Brainstorm has only just begun. Now that we've heard from our first round of speakers and gotten a taste of what's to come, it's time for you to brainstorm with us about the future of neurotechnology. As mentioned earlier, this portion of the event is highly participatory and takes place on the Brains at Play Discord server. In addition to text channels for each of our invited experts, we've also opened a voice channel called BCI Livestream, where some of the student team featured in the video just shown will be playing brain-controlled games on the Brains at Play website. While I'll be staying behind and inviting our experts to publicly comment on high engagement posts here on Zoom, we encourage you to engage fully in the Discord at this time if it's possible, to share your perspective and opinions on neurotechnology, and take full advantage of the amazing minds we have here for you today. So it looks like we have about 15 minutes, and let's get started. So I will invite Dr. Song back up and have him comment on a question from Alec that was previously unanswered uh, during the Q&A. So Alec asks, was the hippocampal model trained for each individual? And if so, how would we design a prosthesis for a patient with an already damaged hippocampus? Yeah, that's a good question. And I got this question almost every time from some smart audience. So for now, what we build, uh, <clears throat> as Alex right, correctly pointed out, are all patient-specific models. So we record data from each patient and build a mathematical model using data from that patient and use that model to enhance uh, the memory function for that specific patient. So as I said, right, there's still a long way to go to move from here to eventually build the hippocampal memory processes for helping people with brain damage, right? 
but there are several possible solutions for this problem. First is we can try to build sort of generic model that can work for different patients. We identify the similarity or the differences across different patients in terms of the signal transmission. So we can build a patient general model that can be used from one patient to another patient. A second is we may rely on new plasticity, which exists in all uh, you know, brain regions, right? We provide the signal as best as we can and the hope that the downstream brain region can be smart enough or plastic enough to differentiate the signals and to better use those signals for the memory formation. And obviously all those approaches need to be tested in future human studies. Wonderful. So now I'd like to jump over to Tim Brown. Tim is a postdoc in Aaron's lab and Caitlin Ringrose asked him, how do you garner end user perspectives to ensure that you're getting a diverse array of experiences in your studies? Hi everybody. Um, so the, the answer to this question is um, uh, that you have, to, you have to acknowledge the problem and then you have to go and take active steps to remedying it. Right, so you can't just go, okay, so we are limited by um, where we are or by the kinds of people that are in our labs or by um, our inability to, to reach out to new groups, right? Um, there's too much at stake, right? Our science could be wrong um, as a result of our inability to get a diverse set of perspectives. So we have to reach out to groups in other areas. And uh, in our group, we've done that through our work with, with, with you, Garrett and Dong, um, <laughs> reaching out to, well, it's, it's not, it's not, um, it's not um, a secret that Seattle's a pretty white place. And so any kinds of end, end user interviews like the ones that we do are gonna, you know, uh, favor uh, uh, white men usually. Um, and so, reaching out to communities, uh, reaching out to different research groups, reaching out in general is extremely important um, and not being afraid to do that kind of outreach work. But also um, thinking of it structurally, um, we can also think of uh, ourselves as situated in institutions that stand against us, uh, that, that, that um, that make it hard to diversify our research uh, research uh, in general. Um, so uh, acknowledging that and trying to work to dismantle the systems of oppression within our institutions, um, even though that seems like an insurmountable task, if we come together, we can do it, yeah? Um, does that get at the, <laughs> uh, answer the question a little bit? Um, uh, yeah, maybe not. So. A, yeah. Thank you, Tim, I appreciate it. You. Maybe not a satisfying answer, but it's something we need to do. Awesome. Now I'd like to invite Jeremy Greenberg and Caitlin Ringrose up to jointly discuss the question by Ashley M. If we can barely trust companies to handle data that we willingly put out in the world, how can we trust them with data from our own minds? I'll let Jeremy go first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a big question there. Um, you know, there's, in terms of um, legislation in this area, um, it seems like uh, that's the way to go. Um, you know, if we want um, private companies, if we want this uh, data to be used responsibly. Um, and I think that there are a couple different options here. You have a number of comprehensive privacy bills and laws being passed um, globally, um, also in the States here in the US and California. and most recently, um, Virginia. Um, and perhaps this is part of a comprehensive privacy law. Um, we um, call out um, neurodata or this technology specifically, maybe it warrants um, higher protections given its sensitivity, or perhaps it deserves its own specific legislation. Um, I think that there are a couple ways to go here, but I really do think it's going to be through um, regulation. Yeah, I, th I think it's hard, right? If we can't trust companies, how can we trust policymakers? Laws move incredibly slowly. Like Jeremy mentioned, there's some 
state privacy laws now that may or may not include biometric data, which might include neuro data. But if you just have a, a few states with comprehensive privacy laws, that's not good enough. Um, and then what's to say that the laws will include neuro data? And what's to say that the laws are even helpful in the first place? So there's a lot of questions there right now. Um, and if we can't you know, trust one another, what can we do? We can put forward self-regulatory models. We can ensure that we have ethical principles. And I know I wanna give a shout out here quickly to IEEE Brain has been working on some ethical, legal and social principles for developers of neurotechnologies. And I'll say that that's a great first step, but we all need to kind of move in concert, educate one another, Policymakers, it's difficult. They all have jobs and other bills that they have to pass. They're not going to be able to understand neurotech. You know, Jeremy and I are lawyers. We don't understand neurotech. We try. Um, so the most we can all do is educate one another and, you know, keep holding one another accountable as we move forward in the space. Yeah. And just to echo, I think that there are, you know, I think that there are a lot of conversations that need to happen about um, this specific data. Um, when you're talking about someone's thought patterns, uh, it seems like there's an extra layer of sensitivity that we have not encountered. This is not typical biometric data. So I think, yeah, these conversations need to happen um, and be debated and yeah, introduced to um, policymakers and lawmakers. Awesome. Thank you both for those responses. Now that we've discussed a little bit about the public side of brain computer interfaces, I'd like to invite James Giordano up to sort of address the question of what is dual use in BCIs and how can BCIs be used in sort of that sort of sense? Uh, thanks very much. And uh, a real shout out to Caitlin also for mentioning some of our ongoing work at uh, IEEE. I have the privilege and honor of now being chair emeritus of the neuroethics section of the IEEE Brain Initiative. And uh, my colleague's point on that was accurate. And I really want to applaud Professor Illis's uh, very, very astute comment about the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, you know, trying to get international discourse on this and or even trying to stimulate dialectic where you have one position, another position, you're trying to get something synthetic. It's very easy to talk about. I mean, our conversation here is but an hour long. It's not so easy to do. And you have different perspectives with different cultures and different values. And this also speaks very strongly to the issue of dual use. Realistically, if we look at any neuroscience or technology, I think that the guiding aim is to try to advance the science and tech for good. Yeah, the big question there is not only philosophical, it's very practical. Who's good? What rationality? What aims? I mean, realistically, even if we're considering dual use, where dual use would be more specifically regarded for things that might have some interest in national intelligence, security, and defense, even national intelligence and security is aimed at trying to keep the polis secure, at least in an open society, a democratic society. Here, the issue is that the military serves the body politic, and the politic then is trying to protect the polis. So the issue here is what's good for kin, what's good for kith, and how do we keep that safe and sound? But once we begin to get into international discourses, have to recognize that as my colleagues have very well alluded to, there's a lot of economic power that goes along with neuroscience and technology, not to mention what Michel Foucault, the philosopher referred to as biopower, being able to affect individuals on a biological level to then affect in some way, the way they think, the way they feel and the way they act. And this is real, this isn't science fiction. I mean, we take a look at some of the work of Elon Musk, we take a look at some of the work of very avant-gardistic DARPA programs, not only that are occurring here in the United States, but a number of DARPA mimetic, DARPA-like programs that are occurring worldwide. I had the opportunity to serve, for example, with the European Union's Human Brain Project on dual use, and it became very apparent that the need to understand what's going on on the commercial sector, on the governmental sector, on the research and academic sector, is very often fueled by various nations' triple helix, the, the union of government, research and the commercial enterprise to advance on one level, neuroscience and technology for economic gain, which certainly affects international hegemonies, leveraging power, but also on the military side and on the intelligence side. And here we're not necessarily talking about weapons of mass destruction, but rather instruments of mass disruption on a variety of scales and levels that range from the cellular all the way to the social, from the individual to the international. 
when we only take a look at the recently published National Academy's report with regard to the way directed energy devices are being utilized to affect patterns of neurological activity to therefore evoke effects on cognition, emotion, and behavior in key targeted individuals to recognize that we now have the capability to engage, develop, and utilize tools of precision pathology. That's frightening, it should be because the level of discourse on the international level is nascent. Current international signatory treaties, such as the Biological Toxins and Weapons Conventions and Chemical Weapons Conventions, are just now beginning to scratch the surface of what neurotechnology can do and how neurotechnology, in fact, should be viewed, guided, and governed. And then the question is, if, in fact, that governance is in place, what are going to be the necessary safeguards to oversee that, and who decides? So these are key questions. And I think in the spirit of the philosopher of science, Bruno Latour, what good science does is not only answer questions, it generates others, but not only in the scientific field, certainly in the ethical field and social field, and the policy field, and more and more that needs to be leveraged on an international multidisciplinary and global stage. So I think that the questions here are really whether the extant ethical principles are adequate and if they are in fact sufficient. And the answer that has come back to my colleagues and working in a variety of different forum, inclusive of NATO, World Health Organization, UNESCO, it's been no, these current principles are not enough. Some of my prior work with Professor Illis and her colleagues up at UBC have recognized the need for an international neuroethics. Once again, easy to say, not terribly easy to do. It's a discursive process, but more than that, it requires dialectic and that dialectic requires a reflective equilibrium and you have to be aware of different definitions of the good and the strivings that it's going to take at those discussion tables and in the reality of pragmatic neuroscience in the public and in the political spheres to define those goods, compromise on some levels and some, to some levels of consensus, not easy. It's gonna require work. And at the end of the day, I think that we can all decide that that juice is proverbially worth the squeeze, so to speak, because we are our brains. And increasingly what we're seeing is that the brain is gonna become at least a partial battlescape of the 21st century, not necessarily in terms of bullets and bombs, but of influence, impact, dissuasion. And that's important to consider because every sort has two sides, one that may be relegated to heal and one that may be relegated to harm. And those harms are very often disguised as goods and what those different values are for various cultures, various politics, and various aims. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Giordano. Um, I'd like to bring up one final speaker. Um, Laura Cabrera was asked sort of, how do we define invasiveness in just general neurotechnology as well as sort of in neuroethics? What are the different perspectives that we can bring upon that label? Hi, uh, Gary. Hi, everyone. Um, I mean, that's a very interesting question, and it was great that it was brought by one of the, you know, people in in, in the forum, uh, where they say, you know, that EEG can be um, not seen as invasive from a physical perspective, but it can be seen as invasive from a more social um, perspective. And it's really interesting because in a recent project where we saw looking at uh, different interventions from uh, TMS, DBS, um, electroconvulsive therapy, that people do have different perceptions regarding invasiveness. So they, they don't only consider physical invasiveness as something that we should worry from an ethical point of view, but we should also consider things like, are these um, technologies being invasive from a lifestyle perspective? For example, the use of, you know, in this case was for therapeutic uses that TMS for depression, you have to go several times in a, in a week to get your treatment. So that was seen as invasive from the patient's perspectives. Um, or in the case of when we talk about how would you compare invasiveness of ECT versus, I don't know, taking, um, going to psychotherapy. They do so, uh, psychotherapy as more invasive from an emotional perspective. There were also participants that say, well, going through DBS is invasive emotionally. Like I feel really, uh, you know, emotionally invested in this, in using this type of invasive technology. So I think we should really try to start unpacking what invasiveness really means and the different kind of layers uh, that come when we discuss invasiveness beyond just the, the physical. Awesome. Thank you for that response. And 
with that, I think we will conclude the public brainstorm. If you all want to continue asking questions on Discord, I encourage you to do so. Um, but for now, to conclude our time together, I'd like to introduce Joe Artuso. Joe is the Director of Marketing and Business Development at OpenBCI, which provided some of the brain sensing headbands featured in the Brains at Play demo video today and in the BCI live stream channel. Joe will conclude Livewire with a presentation entitled Democratization, DRM, and Descartes, the case for open neurotech. Thanks for being here, Joe. Thanks a lot, Garrett. Just gonna make sure I can get my slides set up the right way. All right, you seeing it clearly? Great. Yes. Um, yeah. So thanks, thanks again for having me. Um, you know, it's really a it's really a pleasure to be a, a part of this event and be here with so many other you know talented people. Um, you'll notice that. I'm the you know, director of marketing and business development. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist or an ethicist, but uh, I did spend several years working in the ad tech industry before joining up with OpenBCI. And I think uh, that that neurotech has a lot to learn from some of the ethical failings that happened there. One of the most common questions that I get asked um, at OpenBCI is like, why are you open source? Um, actually, it's usually one of the first things and then people start asking how the hardware actually works. but. Uh, to answer this question, you know, I want to touch on kind of three different ideas from from a couple of thinkers. Um, some ideas from Linus Torvalds, you know, the creator of Linux and you know an early open source pioneer. Um, Corey Doctorow, you know, author and uh, activist and technologist um, who discussed at length kind of the copyright the copyright wars and digital rights management, and then also sort of discuss how uh, Rene Descartes' like famous thought experiment that led him to uh, I think, therefore, I am. You know, and the doubt and skepticism that he brought to philosophy takes on an entirely new, you know, color in a BCI-powered world. So, starting it off with democratization, um, there's this sort of saying called Linus's law, which is uh, that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And this actually came from a book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric S. Raymond. Um, and it's kind of this collection of lessons on software development from open source's early days. Uh, and it's a paraphrasing of lesson eight, which is given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to someone. Uh, the takeaway from this is that opening your code to a large audience actually builds better tools. And it's something that we've taken to heart at OpenBCI and gotten a lot of benefit out of by creating technology that's open and transparent by design. Uh, we actually, you know, we, we want people to be able to see and replicate the way it works so that they can show us where it's not working. Um, we believe that that process you know, and, and adopting openness and transparency from the get-go is, is really going to create better tools in the long run. Uh, you don't need to just take my word for it, though. You know, you can see that there's been an open source renaissance in the business world with huge merger and acquisition activity among open source companies in the last several years. Um, so I think that there's, you know, there's a growing body of proof that shows this approach to development can produce better tools and is something that Neurotech can learn from. But there's not just a business benefit to this. Uh, you know, we one of the other reasons why I think that neurotech development needs to be happening out in the open in a way where people can interact with it, in a way where people can learn from other findings or build off of other people's uh, products is because what's the alternative? You know, the alternative is that a small group of companies or well-funded organizations are, are developing the standards, are furthering the technology, and really the only ones that understand how it works. Um, one of the things that we think about at OpenBCI a lot is kind of this idea of of raising the floor that other people start at in the industry. Uh, and we're trying to promote that. And we think that the industry as a whole could learn a lot from you know, just taking that approach of, will this tool make it easier for somebody else to get started after me? Um, there's also this concept of BCI literacy that I, I, I like to reference. Um, you know, and for any functioning society, having an educated population is important to it functioning well. And the same thing applies to the neurotech space. We need to maximize the number of people that have accessible and transparent tools so that they can become literate in the functionings of this technology as it enters you know, the, main, the mainstream. It's because these BCI literate people will be the ones that 
that are checking for false claims, that are making sure people aren't being manipulated. And without them, there are no, you know, there is no informed public that can keep some of the, the worst uh, actors in check. So I think, you know, by making open, Neurotech open by design, we can create better tools, create that kind of BCI literate public and hedge against bad actors. And as a demonstration of this, you know, I think there's a lot that we can learn from the, you know, the, the war on copyright and the war on general purpose computing and things that happened in the early 2000s around digital rights management. Uh, it all sort of started with the, the DMCA. The, it was an act passed in uh, 1998. And some of you may notice, you know, that this screenshot from movies and DVDs at the time, you know, for anti-piracy PSA. Uh, but you know, the dawn of computers and the internet really changed the game for copyright law. And you know, there was this scrambling of, of technological and legislative uh, measures to try and control what could and couldn't be done in this new technology space. And it feels a lot like where we are today with neurotech. Um, Corey Doctorow gave a couple of talks on this. Um, Corey Doctorow gave a couple of talks on this that uh, I wanna paraphrase here, um, but you know, I. I mention them down in the corner there and you should go have a have a listen listen to them but you know computers are everywhere and increasingly they're in our bodies he references pacemakers and uh hearing aids but you know today he would be talking about Neuralink. um the future will you know because of this the future is going to be full of socio-political problems about governing the use of computers and sort of he blanket refers to that as like digital rights management uh Restricting computers to only approved functions often relies on techniques that obscure or limit user control. And these techniques generally lead to weaker overall security and have been the root of a number of hacks. You know, the kind of the root of the problem here that, that we're looking at with Neurotech now is that there's a number of great reasons to say, make me a computer that runs all the programs except for the one that freaks me out. Make me a BCI that allows me to cure Alzheimer's, but doesn't allow my thoughts to be manipulated by companies trying to advertise to me. So there's always a, there's always a great reason to want to prohibit a certain action. Um, but once you start going down this road, you get into the very difficult question that many other speakers have touched on today is who decides what can and can't be done in these situations. Um, and especially with computers that we start to interface with our bodies. I think generally the answer, you know, comes down to one of these four groups today, at least. Uh, and I think in our current world, the manufacturers are actually really at the top of the food chain and they're going back and forth with government about, you know, what can and can't be done. You, know, you can kind of see this Facebook and Apple are fighting over what is and isn't allowed to be collected from iOS, which would jeopardize Facebook's advertising business. You know, this is a, a microcosm of a dispute that could happen in the future with you know, some sort of implantable neurotechnology device. Um, I think that openness by design and, and giving users the ability to understand what is happening inside their devices, what functionality is being controlled or prohibited or limited by the other actors on this table is a very important part of bringing some much needed power back to device users. The reason is that you know, these, these efforts to control what can and can't be done with computers often have unintended consequences. And you know, if I could cherry pick headlines for over the last several decades, you know, not too hard to find. One of the most interesting ones was you know, even just last December, there was this huge hack called SolarWinds, you know, an IT product that was designed to manage devices for company and government organizations um, had, was compromised, led to this huge breach that's still being unraveled by security researchers. And what's especially interesting about that, I think, was um, Microsoft's response to this hack was uh, was kind of like no big deal to them. Um, you know, at least their public response was that uh, you know open source software development best practices inside of Microsoft mean that they're no longer relying on kind of the secrecy of their source code, the secrecy of the inner working of their devices as a uh, measure of security. It doesn't you know having access to the source code is no longer an elevation of risk for them. And this is another sort of example of how by creating tools that are open by design from the get-go, you can mitigate some of the risks of, you know, what would not have been a foreseeable, you know, threat to them when they were designing these operating systems in the first place. Uh, and back to a quote from, from Corey Doctorow that I really like. Um, this was a 10 years ago and it, you know, still 
holds true to me today is freedom in the future will require us to have the capacity to monitor our devices and set meaningful policy on them, to examine and terminate the processes that run on them, to maintain them as honest service, servants to our will and not as traitors and spies working for criminals, thugs, and control freaks. The alternative to open neuro neurotech is kind of black, black box and proprietary systems that are only going to make it more difficult to validate functionality, detect security flaws, and protect users from manipulation. You know, I, I do truly believe in the kind of Linus's law effect of getting as many eyeballs on things as possible helps to suss out the problems. But this idea of manipulation from BCIs uh, also, I think, takes on a whole new flavor for uh, Descartes' thought experiment, um, you know, where he really he, he started off with this imagining of a, a demon or an entity that was all powerful and manipulating his senses. Um, and from that sort of complete doubt, he actually proceeded to build a single kernel of truth in you know, his, own, his own existence because he was a thinking being. Uh, and from that one kernel of truth, he then extended out to build an entire sort of school of philosophical thought around it. And arriving at that single kernel of truth is going to become more and more difficult as the capabilities of Descartes' demon are actually entering, you know, technical, uh, the, the, the realm of technical possibility. You know, it is, it's feasible that our hearing and our senses are going to be able to be altered by devices that we implant in our body. So the idea that you'll be able to, uh, the idea that you're going to be able to build up to some sort of kernel of truth is going to require that you have transparency into how these devices are working. It's going to require that the more uh, open these devices are, the more transparent they are in their workings, the easier it's going to be for you to sort of, and for security researchers and for the educated BCI public to validate that this is working the way it's intended. This is, there isn't any secret bugs or hidden, you know, gotchas baked into this thing. And it's going to be essential for us, you know, arriving at certainty in a post BCI world. So to summarize, you know, I think that by building tools that are open by design, you know, we can maximize the number of BCI literate users and actually, you know, build better tools and a better population in, in the first place. Um, we can protect users from the dangers of even well intentioned digital rights management. And we can help us arrive at certainty, you know, by protecting from false claims and manipulation. So thank you so much. Um, I'll be around in the Discord afterwards if you'd like to talk. And Garrett, thanks a lot for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And I did want to actually highlight a question by Juliana about advertising, sort of spanning both of your, your history and your present. So do you think advertising for neurotech should be regulated? And also, if it should, like how? I thought you gave a very interesting answer on the Discord. So I yeah, I can uh, resurface it here. You know, I, I do think, I, I think it's great that our, um, the U.S. government is sort of rediscovering some, some regulatory uh, muscle and taking action against major tech companies. I think that one of the best ways to regulate advertising is to focus on uh, the, the platforms that are delivering the advertisements, you know, on behalf of advertisers, you know, the places where the ads are actually being like loaded up and sort of scheduled and, and arranged you know, this is seven, I don't know, mostly this is Google and Facebook, by, by making them responsible for, for manipulative or sort of bad faith advertising that's happening, it'll get taken care of pretty quickly, technically, you know, they'll find ways to make sure that they're not getting penalized for bad actors on their platforms, um, if you hold them responsible. Awesome, thank you for that. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank Joe for a great talk and everyone in the audience for spending your evening with us. This concludes the formal portion of LiveWire's Stimulating Night of Neurotechnology. If you have more questions or would simply like to keep interacting with our event experts and attendees, feel free to linger here on Zoom or on Discord. We'll start breaking everybody out into breakout rooms if you would like to ask more pointed questions to each of the discussion facilitators and speakers as long as they themselves um, can stay here for that time. In general, I'd like to thank USC Visions and Voices, Mirantina Gotsis, Curtis Fletcher, all of tonight's speakers and invited experts, and the Brains Up Place student team for the work they've put into Livewire over the past year. 
it really wouldn't have been possible without, without such an amazing team and I'm very grateful for everybody's support along the way. If you'd like more from the Brains at Play initiative, we have an international design fiction competition going on right now until March 10th. So if you have an idea for a brain controlled game, consider submitting and have the chance to win a Muse2 headband or open BCI ganglion to play these games with, as well as potentially $5,000 from the USC Smart VR Center. Again, we hope you had a wonderful time here. We will open up breakout rooms momentarily and uh, we look forward to hearing your questions and continuing your engagement with us.